Uh, projects that um, we had, um, mostly with Alstead, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, on developing a design process for monopiles, um, particularly for offshore wind turbines. So that's what we've been calling here the Peter Design Approach, and I'll be saying a little bit more about that as we go through. But this is a, an evening about site investigation, and the questions that I was asked to address were, what actually are the site investigation? What are the, the sole data that you need to implement the Peter model? So that's really what I'm going to be saying a little bit to you in the next 20 minutes. But to do that, I'm going to try and explain a little bit what it is. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about, about calibration procedures and, and finally design applications um, right at the end. So this was a research project. So because it's research, we're allowed to simplify the problem and not idealize it. So this was our idealization of the problem. So we want to develop a method that is going to be useful for designing monopiles of offshore wind foundations. Here is our design model. So for the purposes of what I'm saying today, we're concerned in this approach with monotonic loading. We're imagining that there's uh, wind loading, wave loading applied at different heights on the tower. We have a monopile embedded. Oops. Uh, where's the button? Well, Needs to help with the button, I think. That button, okay. Great. So we've got the embedded length L, diameter D. H is what we call load eccentricity. It's the height above the seabed. The horizontal load H is, is, is being applied. So much of what I'm saying today is around this simplified configuration, horizontal load. Um, height H above the seabed, length, diameter, and so on. So, what sort of um, modelling approach is going to be good for designing monopile foundations in this context? And, and you, we could sort of imagine uh, a, a bit of a sequence. So, ideally, we'll be designing using three dimensional fine element methods. Uh, and Mike's given a good overview of, of that. These are the gold standard approaches. But they take a lot of time to set up, very complicated to calibrate, run times are long. So 3D found elements are really, really good, but they're not really practical for routine design or for designing large wind farms, particularly at the early stage. In the middle, what I've drawn here are called Winkler type uh, B models. So these are the sort of PY type methods. That, that Mike also mentioned in his early presentation, where we represent the monopiles of B and have some kind of simplified modeling for the way the soil interacts with the foundation. These have got a, a long and successful history in, um, in, in this application in, in the PY method. We can go a bit further, we can have uh, zero D models. So now we simply represent the head of the pile as a point, and we have some. Uh, relationships that we can devise which relate to the horizontal moment loading with the rotation and the displacement. As we go along to the right, the models become increasingly simple but increasingly difficult to calibrate. But in our approach, we go to the middle. So we're going to develop the winter type models, starting from the PY approach, try and find something that's going to be more accurate but for retaining really the sort of bracket calculation facility that Winkler type methods have. So this was our project. So I, I put this up here really to um, make the point that we had lots of people involved right back in the middle is Orsted. You can probably see up here, this is Miguel, up here, a technical manager, so I put this slide especially. Um, all these other people involved, but the, the academic work group up here on the right, this was uh, people from Oxford University, for um, a co college, University College Dublin. So we had a big team working on a range of aspects uh, around this. And one of the things that came out was the thing we call the Peter Design Model. Now we've just got to the stage where all this stuff now has come out in publications. So you can't sort of see the details, but the papers are all in, in geotechnic uh, under open access. So you can download the papers. What I'm talking about today are these last two, 
uh, papers which are on specifically the design method for clay and for sand. So here we go, this is how it works. So we have a conceptual model which is a monopile embedded in ground. And because we're academics, we're allowed to start by saying this is essentially homogeneous ground. So we've seen a lot about complexity. So we have a single soil type. The, the monopile is loaded with a moment NG, moment of ground level, horizontal force of ground level. There's going to be four types of reaction. So we've got with that, what we call distributed lateral load. So that's the P in the normal PY method. There'll be vertical uh, tractions on the side of the pile, and we have a horizontal force and a moment at the base. And the idea is these vertical tractions equate to a moment, distributed moment, so on the right hand side here. So this is the computational model. So we have some beam elements, and we have four components of reaction a P, distributed load, an M, and then we have uh, a horizontal force H and a base moment N. So we have four components. And the idea is in this modeling approach is we're going to invent some functions that will, re will relate these soil reaction components to the local displacements and rotation. And if we have a good representation of that, then this model on the right, which is very rapid to compute and it's, um, it's programmed in MATLAB, will, will give uh, high quality representations of the behavior of the monopile as observed at the, at the ground surface. So, not wanting to, to do the detail, but, but this uh, kind of gets to the heart of um, the site invest or the site soil data that we need to calibrate the model. So, each of the four These four soil reaction components are represented as a nonlinear functional relationship with the local displacement or cross section and rotation of the pile. Not worrying too much about the details, the point is that we have a function, and I've drawn it here, for the distributed load P against the displacement P. It has four parameters. <coughs> so we have a, a, a stiffness. We have a curvature parameter, this thing NP, there's some ultimate value, and there's a displacement to which the ultimate value occurs. So if we're four loading components, we've now got four parameters, that's 16 numbers we need to calibrate the model. Notice that the parameters have got these bars on. That's quite important because the model is not represented, it does not represent the actual um, variables, it represents normalized forms of them. And the normalized forms are these forms on the right hand side. So, what I'm showing here is what we call the clay framework. So, with the PISA model, we have um, the option of, of having a clay model or a sand model. If it's the clay model, then we use SU in the normalization and we use G0. So the idea is we have a totally dimensions, dimensionless um, way of representing the problem, and then locally we can find the actual soil reaction curves by uh, working backwards from the non-dimensional form based on the local values of SU and G0. So if the question is what data do we need to run the model, it is SU and G0, as simple as that. SAN framework is essentially the same. The data needed are slightly different. So the normalized forms now involve the vertical effective stress and G0 to get. So this is in a sense easier because to run the SAN model we just need to have profiles of the vertical effective stress and G. So how is it all done? And I was looking at this um, actually on the train coming down, uh, and, and I realised that the three blocks on the top fit very nicely with the three uh, speakers this evening because uh, we start with um, a geotechnical model or some idea of what the site is. 
So uh, if you're going to use the design, we understand what that's going to be, and maybe then uh, we can conduct some further calculations in 3D. And the sort of brainwave we had on this project was that what we need to do is to retain the idea of the 3D HUD elements as being the gold standard, and we're going to use the 3D models to calibrate the 1D model. So the 1D model kind of mimics what the 3D model will produce. So the way this works for a specific site is you conduct a series of calibration studies. So what that means is you calibrate the constituent model with all the complexities that, that Mike just uh, mentioned, and then you conduct a series of calculations on example modifier configurations which kind of span the likely space of your design. So you consider the ranges of L over D, the diameters, the load eccentricities, cover that space with um, calculations, extract out from the interface between the pile and the soil detail about the soil reaction curves. You can then optimize the functions I showed you to extract out the parameters. And once that's all done, the simplified model on the right will deliver pretty close to what the 3D calibration calculations computed not just for the calibration part, but for any other part within the space. So you have a very rapid, surrogate type model that can be uh, used for conducting design. So one of the models we have is called Cowden Till. So this links with the test site of Cowden that we used for the PETA project. And what I've drawn here is, is the data we used uh, to develop the model. And the line along the top, I've said, require to cal calibrate 3D part element model because the first step is to build the very complex model that you really believe is going to provide behavior that, that, that you're interested in. And for that, you need SU, G, OCR, K0, you need the variation of shear modules with shear strain, etc., etc. That can be used to generate a calibration model. Once that is done, all you then need is. is, is is the left two uh, depth variations of SU and G0. That's all that's needed to drive the model. So just to, to sort of summarize the, the approach, I suppose, that to calibrate, we do site investigation, calibrate the consistent model, conduct a calibration study, and in the piece of work, calibration study consisted of about 12 configurations. Out come the piece of parameters. Then to apply the model, we take those parameters and, and they, we can use those to design within the parameter space. And I've listed here the models, the names of the models we've developed already. So we have three clay models uh, and a model uh, for Dunkirk sand. And if it all works well, which it seems to, what you get is that when you do a calculation of the horizontal load age versus the ground level displacement, this blue line is a computation from a three-dimensional FD calculation. The green line is what comes out of the 1D model. For this particular set of curves, the 3D FE calculation was not one of the calibration runs. It was a randomly selected set of monopile dimensions within the parameter space. So this demonstrates that the 1D model can do a pretty good job of mimicking what that, that 3D model would have produced, but at a fraction of the computational cost. And the neat thing is that down at the bottom, you can see that red line, PY line, that's what you get in this case with the standard PY method, which I think as Mike mentioned is, is actually regarded as quite a conservative method. So that's the clay framework, and then on the right, the sand framework works exactly the same. What's needed is the uh, small strain shear modulus relative density, uh, vertical vector stress as we go down uh, the, the, the length of the pile. So we recognize, of course, that soil offshore sites are not 
uh, nice and homogenous. We have lots of different uh, soil types going on. So what we try to do then is to take the parameters that we develop from the homogenous calibration process. Is it possible to build them all up in, into a layered system where we simply employ the calibration that we previously devised? And if this works pretty well, and you see here an example where we simply take the parameters from the homogenous soil calibration, we've made that quite a complicated layered soil configuration. These uh, labels here, Dunkirk 45, Dunkirk 60, these relate to relative density. So we have Calvin is, is, is clay, Dunkirk 30, 45 is a medium dense sand, Dunkirk 90 very dense sand and so on. And what you see in the slide is pretty typical of what we get. So here, this is horizontal load, ground displacement, there are two curves, the 3D file the model compares to the, uh, the 1D parametric, it's a particular form of the, the piece of model we're using here. The small displacement curves, these are of interest because these relate to the, the stiffness of the system. So we have separate interests, I suppose, in looking at the small displacement response. And then on the right, we embedded bending modes, uh, predicted pretty well by the, the, the design model. So that's, that's that, this is a summary, so this is the process, so to apply the PISA model, you can either yourself do the calibration study, or you can read the papers and just read off the numbers, that gives you the PISA parameters, you can then apply it to a particular site, and be pretty confident that if the site is layered, you'll get a, a, a pretty good answer doing that. The data required to apply the model is, 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 is pretty modest. Always necessary is G0. And then for clay, just SU, for sand, vertical stress, and relative density. That's it. Thank you very much.